This is Preston Glass, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John and Pete. Yes, you are. You're listening to The Break It Down Show, by the way, coming at you from the lovely Windsor Hills abode and home studio, actually, yeah. in the back. The hang of the, can I, I'm going to embarrass you, the great Preston Glass. Oh, wow. That's an honor. Here's your $25. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for that plug and, and, and within a short view I can see a picture of you and Quincy Jones you and Madonna and you and Randy Jackson <laughs> you and everybody so this place is packed in too there's vinyl there are mm-hmm. CDs there are cassettes and endless endless non-stop cassettes and dad tapes and uh, so Platinum this, records. this is a creative mm-hmm. space last time we had you on we did it from right here and we're no longer quite a starstruck looking at all this memorabilia that you have hanging around here this time we're here to talk to you let's face it we're here to talk to you because we're in the neighborhood so we just stopped, stopped in. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but you just released a cd yes yes about a month ago i released my sixth solo cd entitled the, the stuff, stuff that, that matters. matters yeah you look like you forgot the name of the CD for a second there. Yeah, I was just uh, <laughs> reminiscing. And I said, six CD? I know people out there are probably like, I didn't know you had one. <laughs> well, you know, these uh, solo CDs are more of a labor of love for me. I mean, I, I call myself a, pr- a songwriter at heart and primarily a producer. Right. So when I do these artists things, it's more of a release to use some tunes that may not work for other artists I produce. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, as you listen to the CD, you you have, it seems like a cohesive thread throughout the CD, and that a lot of the material there is, for me and probably, for Pete and myself, probably just because we know you, we hear the song and we immediately go, you know who should do this song, yeah. and then we play that game, yeah. which is just to see if there is a match out there, like who would Preston match this piece right. of work up? with and the funny thing is is we listened to it last time i was here i called you our generation's master of the lush ballad and there are ballads on the cd and they're great but i like the up-tempo stuff on this Mm. cd thank you yeah i tried to put a little more emphasis on the mid-tempo and up-tempo things on this and even on my last few cds you'll notice that uh the ratio is maybe like four to one up-tempo yeah. Because people out in the industry usually hire me for the more of the ballad stuff. So this is a chance to let off steam, so to speak. And say, right. No, no, I can do the up stuff. I was going to ask yeah. you, like, it's a passion project. It's talking to your artistic sensibilities, letting you get some things out. But it also seems like a marketing tool. Something to, to say. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. It keep, I try and do one every couple years mm-hmm. to uh, show I'm still here, still trying to be relevant still mindful of what you said about an album has a continuity so i try to tell stories that once you listen from cut one to the last cut you feel like you've just seen a movie or experienced a whole thing as opposed to yeah going on a nice ride yeah those are my favorite albums the ones have that vibe like of course marvin Gaye, what's going on or mm-hmm. yeah uh, stevie wonder talking book or inner visions other All things of like stevie that. wonder's yeah. albums I yeah feel especially like in the like last that. you know after he Started producing himself, yeah. He definitely yeah. Did, did that. So I'm a fan of that. And uh, while albums maybe are not as popular today, they still sell. And I think the more that people get away from the album thing, the more unique my albums become, and people seem to like it. I purposely go for the, I guess you would call it, movie cinematic kind of vibe even if this even if not all the songs are messy songs or not all the songs apply to the title at least it feels like it belongs on that cd well i think we're going to see a resurgence in the album as a piece of work because i think that served the shrinking attention span of the uh listener to go down to the singles where we are now but i have a 19 year old son who recently was hanging out at my parents house and said, hey, Grandpa, what are you doing with that record player? <laughs> and my dad said, you know, I don't listen to it that much anymore. You know, I got my stuff on my Sonos. And he said, uh, can I have it? 
And my, my dad said, yeah, absolutely, you can have it. So then my dad started to put together a little rig for him, you know, gave him a little amp. And he said, look, this is how you want to put this together. And then they, at the time, my dad didn't even have it plugged in. So he plugged up all the stuff. He had these enormous JVC speakers or Morant's big yeah, wood Marantz. cabinet speakers, yeah, you know. I heard that name. Yeah. And then he started playing some records and my son was just blown away at the warmth and depth and the he, vinyl, yeah, yeah he, he you know just was i think it was unexpected for him so he got really enthused about it now it's sitting in his bedroom and he's got a stack of vinyl that keeps growing he goes to the thrift store and he's combing through vinyl and you know my son has been he's always he's got decent taste in music because he's been exposed but right. now that i see him as a vinyl shopper you know, he comes back with an eclectic mix of stuff. I mean, he came back the other night with, you know, a little stack of records. He must have spent maybe $10 at the Goodwill and came back with like five records. And I mean, there was a Frank Sinatra album in there that I didn't expect to see. There was a, a Ray Charles record in there. And then I popped into his room to say goodbye to him when I was leaving one morning last week. Popped in there and he was listening to songs in the key of life. And I said, uh, and you know. I know that the cement has dried around what I've exposed him to already. He's 19 years old, so I'm not sure that if I said, hey, listen to this, he would listen to me. But I'm happy to say that he's naturally just getting it. He's understanding that people produced albums for mm -hmm. the sake of taking you on a nice journey. Yeah, yeah. It's funny uh, you mentioned songs in the key of life. I just had a listening party uh the day before my CD was released at the Vibrato here in uh, Bel Air, which is Herb Alpert's club. Me being a songwriter, you would think that I would feature all my songs and spe especially stuff off the new CD. Sure. Well, the first song I did was Love's in Need of Love Today, oh, wow. the opening cut of Songs in Need of Keep Life. Yeah. Because that's a song, and as a songwriter, I wish I had written. Yeah. Yeah. But it fit the theme of the night and also what's going on in the world today, too, so. You know, I'm a, uh, even though I'm a songwriter, I'm a big fan of other songwriters. Too. Yeah, that sure that that sure is a theme we could use more of today. So tell us about the listening party, man, because uh, we weren't here. Yeah, it was a night of I call it passing the torch, which we had some legendary R and B artists like Frida Payne, Evelyn Champagne King, Chubby Tavares of lead singer of the group Tavares, and among uh, some phenomenal new young talent that actually blew people away. In fact, the opening song that we did after uh, the Stevie cut was a cut from my album, but I didn't sing it. I had this, this duo named uh, Johnny Manuel and Terry Dexter sing it, duet from my album. Later on, somebody in the audience, which had some interest and some funding, said, I want to give these guys a record deal. <laughs> wow. So uh, guess what my next project is going to be, a yeah. duet album. With Johnny Manuel and Terry Dexter. No kidding. And it's going to be kind of like a Marvin Gaye, Tammy Terrell thing. And, and these guys can blow. But that was the kind of night it was. It was like the old passing it to the young, the young giving respect to the older. Uh -huh. The whole thing was filmed. Also, something great that's coming out of that night is uh, I'm working on a TV show now called Passing the Torch. Wow. Using the footage from that night. Going to do some more little interviews and then take it to uh network and then see if we can make a series out of it. that's another thing that the world could use is a, a do a, a duo like marvin gay and tammy terrell yeah yeah when we get off the air here i'll play you a little bit of that because people were actually i mean they got a standing ovation it was kind of mind blowing i knew it was good but people were astounded but they told me after that uh, they hadn't heard such such uh, talent and such young people's uh you know singing in years so Wow. Yeah. You know, good songwriting, I feel like, brings qualities out in a young singer because, man, sometimes you see a young singer who's just got incredible pipes. But when you're young, what you what you have in incredible pipes, you lack in life experience. And sometimes That's you can't point, write man. a song. I mean, we caught Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell right at the point where they had all the vocal dexterity. And just enough life experience to sing about heartache, to sing about triumph, to sing about love. And, and look who they had writing their songs, Ashford yeah. Simpson. Right, right. I mean, you know, and uh, the Motown staff. So 
Yeah. Songs do bring to life vocalists, and vocalists can bring to life uh, songs. I mean, a great example is that very song that I had that duet uh, duo sing that night. I had somebody listen to it the other day. They said, hey, I have your CD. I don't remember that song being on there. They re-listened to it, and they said, oh, oh there I remember it. it. Uh-huh. But I... I but it's just a whole nother thing with these guys singing. They can, <laughs> I didn't take it as an uh, as offense because yeah. you know when a great singer sings a decent song, I'm I'm not I don't consider myself a singer. I'm a songwriter that happens to portray the song. But they they loved it the new way. So that's what I hope my CDs will do is is some kind of way get exposed to artists that can really blow or just a, be a forum to to show my songwriting. Well, you know, as a songwriter is like an architect. You know, you draw an amazing piece of work and then somebody comes up and builds it and sometimes you can walk up to a lovely structure and go man look at this beveled glass and the angles on here and the you know and somebody built it beautifully right but it came from an architect who started with a marvelous design that's a good point i have to remember that i'm gonna borrow that up that's okay (laughs) the architect of love (laughs) i wonder how many children have been conceived (laughs) thanks to the work of preston that's funny when when you have an artist that wants to sing one of your songs and you start on get them in here in the booth and they start singing it at what point is it too late to say man this may not be the song for you like you don't have the the age and the miles to to sing this like i remember uh singing luke wilson Willie Nelson's son, you know, and he gets his stage time and everything, and he's singing the blues, but he's 18 and privileged. You know, it's like, I, I just don't believe <laughs> yeah. that you've got the blue, you know, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, I mean, is that even a thing, though? Can yeah. someone get here and you're like, how do you take yeah. someone who needs Sometimes that? Sometimes that, that doesn't happen as often with me, but it has happened. A lot of times because I try and do a lot of pre-production and forethought and even pre-rehearsal. With, you know, I don't, usually I don't go in the studio until I've sat down with the artist and we go through songs and, and we see it. So nine times out of ten, we'll weed that out in the pre-production. Mm. It's process. already happened. Right, yeah. right. But uh, that's important. That's the matching up of not only the material, but also the key. Making oh, sure it's yeah. the right key, making sure it's um, the arrangement. You know, you're not putting too much production on a song that doesn't need it and vice versa. So It's funny that we have guests on sometimes who are great at something but aren't used to being orators. So we have to coach them like, when you get on this microphone, understand that the listener is going to hear you and that there's a difference between, you know, approaching the microphone this way and this way. And when you get animated and talk with your hands and move your head to the side, all that stuff. But you also have when you're recording a vocalist who's interpreting your song, you have not only the sonic sweet spot, you mm. have the emotional sweet spot. And then within their range as a vocalist there's a sweet spot and your job as a producer that people tend to overlook completely is to match up every sweet spot that an artist brings and in every component that they're delivering their performance in yeah that all that is a very good observation and then there's also the i guess you would call it the psychological dynamic between the producer and the vocalist to where they may feel that they did a good job they use this word a lot feel that felt good Mm. or they didn't feel that good and i always say to them i don't know how you felt but that sounded great or or the opposite Uh, you Uh might have felt good but that didn't sound (laughs) you know the public can't really tell how you you're feeling because they ain't seen you they're listening to just the sonics and the emotion of it so I know it sounded great. So if you if you don't feel good, I'm sorry to hear that, but <laughs> that's yeah. a keeper. Right there, <laughs> right. you know? So when you're when you're producing and you want to get a different emotion, though, maybe do you give them a feeling like I want you to think about? And I yeah, don't know what those yeah. words are. What are those and words? It, and I'm it depends curious. on the artist. There's oh, yeah, some right. that respond differently. respond to that, and some that some that you don't have to do that. They just naturally know what to do. But the ones that you want to give a, another option to. Yeah, you know, it might even be something that I'll do. I might turn the lights off or dim the lights. Or I might say, uh, sit down on this one so yeah. it sounds a little more relaxed. Or, right. And then, yeah, think about, I did something with Evelyn King, a song that we we co-wrote with Tony Haynes called Open Book. It was really about her life. Even though she co-wrote it, you know, I wanted to really remind her that this is about things that you went through. This is about your life. So sing sing it like you're talking about the ups and downs that she went through and she literally cried you know 
on the song. And she did it at the listening party. She cried again. Wow. It just, and it was so beautiful. But yeah, emotion is, I, I'll pick emotion over a perfect pitch uh, every time. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, Evelyn Champagne King is a veteran. I mean, she's been at it for many, many years. And, and for her to make a connection with her own song, because you as a producer were able to go in and say, okay, let's approach it like this. That is another overlooked production thing. I mean, when you said, sometimes I go in and turn off the lights, I thought about <laughs> Donna Summer and Giorgio Moroder. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I recorded yeah. Love to Love You, Baby. Yeah. I wonder. Who, <laughs> yeah, we wonder about that. Uh, I, I thought about Jim Morrison and the stuff that they did with him uh, when he got, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, it's it's amazing what you can do anything you want in a studio. And I always say to people, all we need is you to hit it once. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes performers don't understand that because they'll say, "Well, this is this this is just too high." I mean, I I say if you hit that once, I got it. Now, what you do on stage, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to hit that twenty yeah, times. We're gonna give but, you something to live up to for yeah, the next forty years. Yeah, but of your that's life. not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a problem that is today. Yes. The exactly. best performance right now out of this artist today. And I have, there are a lot of producers out there who have, I mean, for every producer, there's a different method. Yeah. And true. every artist, a different thing you have to employ. Yeah, so. even even the word producer is different to, to, to different people. Well, we just had that conversation, yeah. what, yesterday? Yep. Yeah. Talking about really? the, the role of a, a showrunner and a producer and how those can mean a person who delegates a person who micromanages, who person, you know, right. so many different things in between. And how you interface with the artist yeah. is going to be, I mean, how many projects have you done where, you know, you were chosen for that project because of your relationship to that artist? Yeah. These days, especially, it's nine times out of it. Well, people have asked me, why have you been able to sustain yourself that long in the industry and it seems like you're not even slowing down? I said, it's not necessarily because... I've made my music better. Or I'm the best guy out there. Or I, I think uh, everybody's, you know, feels they're good or have talent. It's because of the relationship with the artists, and then those people keep coming back, and then word of mouth too. So that's very important, I think, as a producer is treating people right. This this is really their lives going on to well back the, in the day with vinyl, but onto recording. So yeah, you're you committing know. their life to posterity. Yeah. So it's important that you show them that you care about that and uh, respect the legacy of it all. Yeah, and not so much impose my thing on them. My favorite producers are those that can do, I think I might have brought this up before, but like a Quincy Jones where, you know, he can produce Michael Jackson and do Michael like Michael. Yep. And then go do Frank Sinatra and it's, it won't sound nothing like the Michael Jackson album he just did. Yeah. Because he's into the artist. Yep. And he's bringing the best out of the artist. I mean, you know, with you or with Quincy or with when an artist comes back, maybe in the back of their mind, they're thinking that doggone Preston, man, he's going to make me have to hit that note for the next 40 years now. <laughs> but that that day that I hit that note was the best creative day that I had. And I yeah. want to recapture that magic and put that in the bottle. Uh, it's, yeah. You know, I've been fortunate to hear stories of like you're talking to me now about my experiences I've had friends like Holland Dozier and Holland and Quincy and whoever. And we'll just sit around and talk about things that they went through, talking to Lamont Dozier about the Four Tops and how Levi Stubbs, the lead singer, they purposely would make him sing at the top <laughs> of his range on all those songs, I Can't Help Myself and Reach Out, I'll Be There. And, mm -hmm. and he would be mad at them. <laughs> but then For when they were number, went to number one, he, they would be... He, you know, you're not so mad so when you go number one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the one hand, but he's. They said that we were just trying to bring out the emotion. Of course, he had a great voice, but when he sang at a certain range, yeah, nobody sounded like that, right? And it sounded like he was pleading, crying. You or, heard the or, angst, and yeah. the the desperation, or the yeah, exactly. And then now, as a, as an older gentleman, I can imagine him going. Man, I can't hit that note quite the same as I used to <laughs> when the pipes were sharper. Right. We're going to do this song at E flat. <laughs> <laughs> Double play. <No. laughs> Break it down. John and Pete. Hey, everybody. If you like the Break It Down show. I can dig it. And of course you do. Of course you do. Hit that subscribe button. John and Pete. It helps us out. Hey, if you're going to like the show I on Facebook or on Twitter, it helps us out if you share the show so people can learn about it. 
So liking it is great. Sharing is even better. Let's do some spy stuff. Yeah, just let's get all our friends' phones and have them subscribe to the Break It Down Show. Do it. Subscribe. Listen to the show. If you love the show, tell five of your friends. Or if you hate the show, tell five of your friends. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, again, the crowd loves it because those songs, by that time, when you say 40 years, like you said, yeah. Just to have a song last that long and be remembered, that they should be thankful. That's you know? magical, yeah. I'm always curious about choices that folks like you make who create with creative people. And I'm thinking about your song. If I get the name wrong, I apologize, but the song Never Die on the CD. All good music will never die. Okay, yeah, right. First off, I'm always trying to figure out what instrument, even if you play it on the keys, what instrument was there? Is that a, is that a glockenspiel in there? Yeah, or is that a funny. church bell? <laughs> yeah, it's a glockenspiel, but it's, you know, it's a synthesizer. Yeah, but, yeah, But right. the name of it, of it is glockenspiel. And then yeah. how does that choice come to you? You're like, this is time for the glockenspiel, as opposed to maybe the little itty-bitty church bells. Yeah. You know, that could do a similar job. Those glockenspiels cut, you know, bing, you could have a 50 instruments going at once, but when you could yeah, put to that go little through. ding, yeah. more so than synth bells or even the church bells. That particular song was funny. Is There was a group called Blue Magic back in the day. They were known for their ballads. The side yeah. show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were known for their ballads, and they had glockenspiel on that almost uh-huh. every, on every song they did, really. Ding, ding, ding. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That song, Good Music Will Never Die, was actually written for them. When they did up-tempo things, which were not, they weren't known for that, but they had some really great up-tempo things on their albums, and they would always have a glockenspiel in there. So I, I ended up just putting that on my album because I liked the song. You know, yeah, so. yeah, that's a good song. And how long ago did you write that song? About a year ago. Okay. Yeah. And like I said, I was writing a bunch of tunes for Blue Magic. Project was on the business side, taking a while, so... I ended up just giving them one song, which, ironically, they just cut two days ago. They put the vocals on, and that's going to be their single. So, uh, And it's more like the ballad, the sideshow kind of thing. Okay. I am happily amazed that Blue Magic is still around. <laughs> because when you think about a group like the Four Tops or the Temptations, you know, you can imagine that group taking shape and having their, you know, big hits and their string of good stuff and then sticking with a generation of people and the generation after that when you hand your songs down to your kids and stuff and the band evolving like the temptations did getting new singers and continuing on but blue magic you know to me was like their run was not quite as long and they could easily have said all right fellas we're going to call it quits yeah. and they and they uh, are still around and still hanging in there yeah the great thing about a song like sideshow that can keep a group working for 40 years or more and that's exactly what happened with them i mean those diehard fans will know the other cuts but right you go see them at a show and you can tell who's been on the ride with the band and that's what they're coming to see so maybe this the you know the shows aren't as well attended as they were when sideshow was an enormous hit but the diehards stuck around and yeah. continue to yeah. support them yeah. from city to city. And I'm glad that I've been able to, uh, I guess you could say, a conduit or somebody that they can rely on these these older acts yeah. to not only uh, write them a song, but to kind of know what what their sound is, even know what their sound is. And, right. And then be, because there are many producers that are even fans of those acts that when it comes to actually getting in the studio with them, they're like, well, the you know, record companies aren't interested in these acts. And I can name a couple of producers right now I used to work with and for that are now saying, how do you keep working with these guys? How do they come back around? Because they knew all along that I was there. Like, there's a couple of these other cats that now out of necessity are like, well, maybe I will work with these guys because they're not getting other work. Yeah. But it's too late because these guys know, well, you weren't there before. Mm-hmm. And I'm always there for them. And that's what that's why this passing the torch idea is an exciting thing for me because I've always had the respect for the older artists, and now maybe on uh, means by by doing a television show I can uh, pass that on to them too, and then they can pass something on to the younger artists too. Well, what fascinates me about that relationship is that 
I can see when Blue Magic, who achieved veteran status yourself, but Blue Magic got a few years on you. So when they come to Preston Glass, the young man, the young producer, they have a certain experience that, you know, and you extend that respect to them for their contributions. But as they grow and their and their path gets longer and they get a certain experience that their fan base goes on with them, they're communing a, communicating a good, you know, a message that's still unique, but that has also taken on a patina, if you will. So like a song like Good Music Will Never Die that is the song of an older artist working with a producer with whom they've had a long relationship and it should be and as a as an audience member you know when uh, sideshow now i'm adding a few years onto my own imagination but if i'm with blue magic when sideshow is a hit by now I'm looking for a message that has aged with us. Right, right. Not trying to... Yeah, that's a good point. I guess chasing the fad or chasing the dollar bill even, some of these established artists are like, well, I got to stay new. I got to stay fresh. I got to, you know, whatever they're wearing, I got to wear what they're... But see, the real fans want the old thing you know, right and the new fans don't really and even care. if it's an updated old yeah. thing it's like well if i'm looking at the band and let's say the way they dress or the way they present themselves i'm not necessarily saying hey wear, wear what you wear when sideshow was a hit but just acknowledge and respect that we are a certain age and we've right. earned the right to say hey we've updated what we how we present ourselves what we right. wear exactly. but it's still cold-blooded like it was in the in, you know in the day exactly so that is sort of your delivery musically in the studio is, you know, maybe not so much a callback as just a showing respect for, hey, man, this this is a long journey. This is a long path. Let's acknowledge it. Let's not ignore right. that we that you have this longevity in the business. Yeah. Even as a younger person, I got introduced to Diana Ross and Diana heard actually she heard four of my songs when she got re-signed to Motown back in the early 90s. Yeah. And this time it was Gerald Busby that signed her. Huh. They wanted her to have that success that she had with uh, Upside Down with Nile Rodgers and all that. So they got her back with Nile Rodgers, but she wasn't digging the cuts that Nile was bringing. Was bringing because yeah. He didn't go on the same sort of journey he, of maturity. Yeah, yeah. And Not uh, knocking what journey his was, but it was a different journey. Right. And But I, th I found out later it was, it was kind of a continuance of the last hit album they had where she went in and she mixed all those things upside down. Uh, I'm coming out. Uh -huh. She remixed all those songs to help them help those songs come alive ah. and Nile didn't like like the fact that she did it Gerald put them back together so they were throwing dozens of songs at her and she didn't like Michael Jackson threw songs at her she didn't like any of them and all of a sudden this person she never heard of Preston Glass sent five songs and out of the five she liked four she said who is this guy wow. so she invited me to her uh, house in Connecticut she just had the twins, and she was playing all these things. And she said, you know what, man? I want you to produce this album. Wow. I almost got to produce it, but Powers That Be and, and Niall came to the table. But Niall and I communicated and said, you know what? She really likes your song, so I'm going to lean on you heavily on this album. And what I told him was, don't let her try and be... She she was infatuated with Janet Jackson at the time. Ah. Uh. And... But in my mind, and, and I even told her, you're Diana Ross. That's right. Yeah. I said, do you know the words Diana Ross, what that means to Janet Jackson? I mean, right. I said, don't chase her. Yeah. And she was she listened to what I was saying, but I don't think it really sunk down deep. And and that's the conversation I had with Niall is, you know, you're you're from back, you know, chic and all that. That's that's the music. So yeah. don't let her try and chase all that stuff. And the, the four songs that I wrote, I think, were the most melodic songs on the album. Everything else was Nile stuff. But the album ended up not doing much because the production was of trying to chase Janet Jackson. If you look at her picture on the cover, she was wearing jeans and with holes in them. And yeah. I mean, we're talking about Diana Ross. We're Miss talking Elegant, about you know, Diana Ross. You know, that's Central what Park. Yes. With the, the, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. But she was trying to chase the younger thing. And I think since then now, She's like, oh, she realized, okay, I don't have to do that. I, I have my I have my crowd, and Janet has her crowd, and some of Janet's crowd is going to come over and look at me, but they're going to look at me because I am Diana yeah, Ross. There you go. And I noticed that a lot of, uh, because I work with a lot of these older artists, and a lot of them happen to have uh, legendary 
status, a lot of them don't really look at themselves that way. Yeah. yeah. They look at themselves, like, okay, this is my next record. I got to stay relevant. And and then whereas I'm able to tell them, do you know who you are? Yeah. yeah. You don't have to do that, man. That's you know? the same, though, at any kind of elite level. I try not, I've been trying not to use sports analogies, but I'm going to go ahead and use one anyhow. <laughs> You know, a pitcher that comes up and makes it to the major leagues is there because his stuff works. Right. He gets people out. You don't got to throw someone else's slider or curveball, right? Right. You throw what got you there, you know. But it, it, that's the hard – that's you know, like where NFL guys talk about the speed of the game and they had to get used to that. That's where it is for pitchers is I had to believe that and actually – My stuff was working. I belong here, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, that's a good point. And uh, chasing – use the word about trying to have someone else's – stuff yeah and i had to learn that too in order to just kind of stay in the don't there was all. a point yeah there was a point where i was like hip-hop was coming in rap was coming in and especially being a black producer record labels were like well he's a black guy he should be doing hip-hop he should be doing and i started you know let me see what i you know i can do that too you know because some of it i liked yeah. and uh but then i said you know what this ain't working because there are those that do that at at, at heart and there are not many people to do what i do at heart if i lose my heart i ain't gonna be doing none of it <laughs> so i stay i stayed to what i do and then it's come back around keeps coming back around that yeah. that is such a so we get this all the time where it's such a common theme with the people that we talk to again you guys all work at this elite performance level we had on uh yesterday co-producer from gray's anatomy and she started as an actor and then made the, the step over to writer, and everybody's like, don't do it. But she knew in her soul, I'm a writer. And so she tried to write a treatment for an episode of Friends. But she's not, what she didn't know then was that she's not a half hour comedy writer. Uh, she wrote a spec. She yeah. wrote a spec for Friends and a spec for Mad About You. And when she gave them to people, you know, they were well constructed scripts. And this woman, by the way, is hilarious. Yeah. But on the page, yeah. that was not her vehicle. Right. And a lot of people read them and said, you know, you really know these characters very well, but this script isn't funny enough. <laughs> and she was, you know, hurt, insulted and stuff. But really yeah. what ended up happening was she had to realize that the people who are telling me this, uh, maybe I'm speaking to Diana Ross about your conversation, but she had to realize the people who are telling me this do love me. And they're coming at me in a constructive way yeah. to tell me that this isn't what I should be doing. I should be doing this. Yeah. So when you talk about Diana Ross, though, right. a lot of and I'm not here to bash record labels, but record labels have an obligation to make money. So when you have Diana Ross and you're Gerald Busby, you, your desire for this record is for it to do financially very well. And, hey, Diana, maybe you should put on these jeans with the holes in them. <laughs> you know, maybe to him that sounds like a good idea because everybody's fan base at a certain point in their career begins to begins to diminish. And it's a hard business to accept that decline and incredible foresight for somebody to be able to say, hey, I sold 10 million albums at one point in my career. Right. This year I'll be lucky to sell this much less but i'm not betraying my fans yeah i think somebody that's done well in keeping their old fans and has got a slew of new ones and reinvented itself was is charlie wilson yeah and uh i think the way he did that first of all he kept his physical appearance up or he's even more uh yeah good for charlie yeah, wilson he's fortunate in that level because you know, he went through some things. Sure. But uh, musically, I think he's singing those love songs that never grow old. He's not trying to be too young. He's got some grooves that are definitely the youngsters gravitate to. Yeah. But they're still melodic. He's still got the voice. I think he's a perfect example of somebody that bridged it just right, not too young and not and he's kept his old fan base so. and managed to gain some new fans by working with some you know doing some collaborations with some younger artists yeah. to yeah. reintroduce him to a generation of of listener but without leaving behind because you know when you say hey diana ross was here with the jeans with the holes in him i go oh come on diana you know i know what i love about you and you know let's stay with that Right. That's my selfish desire, you know, but I'm not going to make up the difference in, in album sales that, that her record label is going to say, come on, let's, you know. Yeah, and I, I guess in her, her case, it's 
I actually heard her say, what do you think of Janet Jackson? You know. Yeah. And so there's nothing wrong for, I don't care how big you are, an artist that's huge to look and admire younger things. But if you are already a legend and you're not waning, you're, you're, you're still relevant and people love you, yep. I'd say go on and do it. I mean, uh, again, Quincy Jones, I know he's a big fan of all music. I mean, yeah. whether it be Pavarotti or, you know, funk music. And he'll sit there and talk about, you know, opera and classical and jazz, and yet he ain't gonna go do opera and opera album. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if if somebody, you know, he'll admire it, but still, he'll do himself. He'll do what he does. So. Right. May dabble in other things that stretch his capability, but what he's doing is widening his own lane and allowing us to be comfortable with that lane. That lane reaching a little, a little bit in both directions yeah. or whatever. I had a good friend of mine tell me. um Somebody I've known for 30 years, he said, after I finished my last solo CD, he goes, pressing on your next one now, I think what you should do is just change it up. I mean, you've told me how how much you like, uh, what's the, bolero music, yeah. you like uh, yes. flamenco, guitar. And it's time for your a, country album, yeah. Preston. <laughs> yeah. You know, and he's saying all this stuff, and he, he knows because he, he plays that music around his house, and I'm like, that's bad, you know. Da, da. Yeah. But but I, I'm like, and so I, I, I didn't tell him I wasn't going to do it, and then I handed him my new CD, and he plays and He goes, Preston, I thought I told you. Uh, <laughs> I said, I'd heard what you said. I ain't going to do those kind of albums. That ain't me. <laughs> I mean, it's just because that's, just because you admire musician of certain style and stuff doesn't mean that's that's you. you know? Right. I know I stay in my lane. You have, and speaking about producing on the song side, unless on the artist side, you have certain tools you have that work well. Niall has certain things that he does. I've noticed that you have a knack for using like the mnemonic, the repeating of that hook, right? So no matter what happens, I'm hooked. Like I, that song is still going in my head right now. Is that something that you do? consciously where you say this song all i need is this little piece here and this song is going to work and well, then other songs like she blinded me with science there's 15 hooks in that song yeah it's just yeah, a hook yeah, fest, yeah you know yeah i like to do songs that have as many hooks as possible uh, for instance like we don't have to take our clothes off that i did uh, jermaine stewart i guess was the original artist to me there were two big hooks in there and of course the court well maybe maybe three we don't have to take our clothes off uh and then we had the na 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 then we had the little uh -huh. cherry yeah. wine thing because i know notice a lot of people would come up to me and say did you write that song uh, cherry, cherry wine, wine. <laughs> uh -huh. so but now this artist in england just had a big hit with that same song ellie Iyer. she did it as a ballad but she didn't even put the na na in there it's funny. So at my listening party, I did two separate versions. I I started at one with just na na na, na you know, up tempo, and it just highlighted and then the I had na na na. Girl come in and do that. It was like two different songs. Wow! <laughs> but they were both hooky. So yeah, I like a lot of hook. I also know that if you have two good ones or maybe three, that's all you need because too mm. much of a good thing. Right. right. And Tom Bell, the guy that uh, gave me my start, Philly producer, he said. Something that's stuck in my head. Let me just tell our listeners if yeah. you're looking it up. T H O M. Yes, -L -L. exactly. Thom. When I was a kid, I used to think it was Thom Bell. But <laughs> it's Tom Bell. He's. It's not. What What makes a hit record is not what you put into it, but what you leave out. Now, I I remember when he first said that I was like, "What does that mean?" But now I know what he means. Being a creative person, we have a tendency to want to check this out. Ooh, put that yes. in there. Put that in it. Ooh, they're gonna love that. So as a creative person. Don't, don't give them too much in one song. You know, take it easy on them. Yeah, yeah, take it easy on. Them. I have to say two things, folks who listen to the show and hear me over and over again. Uh, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge because you mentioned upside down, and I'm coming out, and that were produced by Nile uh, that featured my favorite drummer, Tony oh, Thompson. Yeah, Tony Thompson. I just want to say that. But getting back to your point, I grew up in Vallejo with this uh, drummer named Dwayne who's everyone called happy and it was because he was genuinely happy on the drums so when he would play at church it was a perfect place for him he could get as happy as he wanted to get but he'd had a, he had a hard time gigging outside of the church because people always had to say happy take it easy you got dial it back man come on and he'd be so happy just to be playing that his fills would be outrageous oh, but it would be like 
we don't need that right there. Yeah. Can you just hold back? And he had such a hard time holding back. It was his natural enthusiasm, and I love you, Happy, if you're listening to this, but that was an obstacle for him. Yeah. And a lot of people in bands that he played with would be like, no, I love playing with Happy in church, but I can't put him on this record. It's too happy. One of my favorite drum fills is right after that first break in uh, You're the First, the Last, My Everything, where the instrumentation drops out and then it comes back with just a single snare hit. That's it. You know who that drummer is? Who who played that? Ed Green. Ah. And Ed was a Nashville, a white boy. Uh huh. Probably the most sampled drum intro is that very. You know, uh, I'm gonna look. Yeah, yeah. That's him. He, I think, he was a great drummer. His time was impeccable. But one of the best things about him and drummers take notice: his drum set uh -huh. sounded great. That snare sounded pow. great. That's why on that Top. break, oh. <laughs> that was it. On all them Barry White records or yeah. anything he played on, by the way. It, his snare set or his uh, drum set sounded impeccable. Yeah. So you could be a great drummer but if your your equipment ain't happening, and that that affects the recording. So yeah, yeah, it sure does. It's so important to have your stuff, not just drummers, everybody. Your stuff's got to sound good. Yep. So drummers who pay attention to changing their heads, cutting their That's edges right. every every now and again, and you guitar know, just, players with the strings, uh, the, the dullness. Of a string, you could be playing your butt off, but if you can't hear hear what's going on, it's it that's affects a, yeah, you. Yeah, that's incredible. You know? I, I, yeah. I'm a big U2 fan. And one of the things that Ed requires of his guitar tech is new strings every, every guitar time. every day. There you go. And he has to, he is the guitar, so <laughs> like, he knows. It. He's like, did you change? It? <laughs> he could, yeah, yeah, not yeah, on yeah. this one. Oh well, uh, you change it. Yeah. There you go. That level of detail though is, is where the he can't afford that lack of brilliance. He needs those strings to yeah. be perfect. So. I mean, you know, certain instruments don't require that, but right. uh, but even on a grand piano, making sure it's tuned every. If you can have it tuned every time you do a song or session, that's that's the way to go. Early on in our podcast history, we were trying to get Tommy McElroy on the show, Ooh. and eventually, what's up, Tommy? He did come on the show, and he he he's one of our most frequent <laughs> listeners and commenter. But early on, we were trying to get him to come on the show i think we were maybe one episode in not and, very far that's and, for sure. try, and trying to get him and we were in a meeting with Dwayne wiggins from tony tony oh, tony yeah. and we said Dwayne, we're What's trying to Dwayne? get we love you too yeah we love you too <laughs> Dwayne. we we were trying to get we said Dwayne, we're trying to get tommy would you mind if i just said hey tommy uh Dwayne said if if you were going to do our show we would we, we could do it at his place because the two of them hadn't seen it had worked together many years but hadn't seen each other in a while so they were overdue for a reunion, and we wanted to cause it. So that was just my my uh, excuse to poke Tommy and go, come on, man. Dwayne said we could do it at yeah. his place. Dwayne said, yeah, man, tell him whatever you want to tell him. And, 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 if he, and if you get him out of the cave and here, if he comes from the house and comes here. Granted, these places, by the way. Mm -hmm. are five miles apart? Five, five <laughs> miles apart. Yeah, just one part of Oakland to another. Uh, so it was just, if you get Tommy out of the house and he comes over here, I'm going to get my piano tuned. Yeah, <laughs> and then it became our mission. Like, you know what? Never mind our selfish uh, desires. We need to get Dwayne to tune that doggone <laughs> piano because that piano was man. Woo! Uh, so yeah, that's funny. make your stuff sound right. Instrumentalists, that's important. It's it's just like my comment about your respect for an older artist and their maybe their updated look. Now, one of the bands that I really love, always loved. Well, I say the whispers, but I always say the whispers. The OJs. And when you see the OJs, they will always be tuxedoed and clean. And their tuxedos may be today's tuxedos. They're not wearing the big old ruffles they used to wear. Right. They're updated. Yeah. Same with the temps. If their their mm. outfits today are totally updated, but they're not out of style of the temptations. Right. Still, right. They're still wearing the same, you know, for all five of them, but it's not the ruffles. It's not the... It's today's clean tuxedo. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. it's not betraying the clean tuxedo. Right. So update your stuff, everybody, but keep it clean and keep and keep it with your thing. Keep it, keep it, keep it real, I guess, because, you know, some some didn't wear that. Some were in jeans. But, well, keep that, keep that, keep your thing going. Whatever got you there, keep it going. Yeah, that's what everybody loves about you. So, anyway... I'm glad to see you keeping it going. We're glad to hear that your listening party went well. I hope you uh, sell a bunch of this album, and I hope that people get back to albums. 
No, oh, thank um, you, thank you. I just found that the artist thing is another way for me to connect with artists, maybe even more, I mean, with the audience, even more directly. Sometimes songwriting, you have to go through the the artist or through the producer, or through the record company. And uh, I won't say any names, but there's a couple of prominent artists that encouraged me to do these solo CDs because I wasn't thinking anything about it. And what I would do is turn in my demos because, you know, I'm still singing the demos, but it's for Algebra or it's for George right. Benson. Or and then a couple of them said, man, what? Have you ever thought of doing your own album? And when it comes from the mouth of like a, quote unquote, you know, whoever it was, uh -huh. I'm like, really? Not are, you, gonna, are you just really saying not going to say, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and people that I, uh, I consider great songwriters, but then maybe they're not as known as artists, but they've written some of the most classic songs in the world. They said it too. And 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 maybe because they went that route, they didn't feel like they were the artist. So their encouragement to me is it's like, wow, maybe so. And then they continued to support me by coming to the listening parties and stuff like that. So Yeah. Yeah. You're well, trying that, to guess. That, but that, that, narrows, that narrows the field a little bit. <laughs> You're trying to guess, but I ain't gonna put them on the spot. Hey, you said Jerry Martini came to the listening party. I want to acknowledge yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Jerry and his wife came all the way from the Bay. They're actually very good friends of some friends of ours that uh, they actually flew in on their private jet. Uh, oh, yeah. Excuse me. In fact, when I said that on the mic, I, I said I'd like to thank Jerry and his wife who came in with our good friends uh, Hoppy and Linda from Manteca on their private jet, and everybody started laughing like like I was joking. Like, uh huh. I said seriously, and then started laughing some more. <laughs> but no, it's true. Well, thank he, you for he bringing came them down, Hoppy and Everyday Linda. people. Yeah. Oh wow. So. Yeah. I'm glad to hear he's still at it as well, and it's a joy for me to see that. I wish I would have been there, man. I, I'm sorry that I missed it, but it's a joy for me to see that the musical community sticks together and loves each other the way that it does, and I think that's why we enjoy having musical creators on our show so much is because, man, Pete and I are just purveyors of love, and yes. there is no better place to find love than at the hang here with the great Preston Glass. Man, we've had you for for an hour. I'd like to thank you for inviting us in here again, letting us drop in. We wish you uh, continuing success and continuing contribution to our ears and, and everybody's spirit of love. You're still helping people make babies, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault. Uh, well, no, I really appreciate it, uh, John and Pete. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, we're going to continue to come on this sit on this couch and, and have you talk to us, too. Great, man. great. Please do. Cool, cool. So, yeah, yeah. It's it's funny when you said five miles apart, and yeah. I know there's a bunch of people right yeah. in this little area here. Some that I don't even know, but yeah, uh, musicians I know. Sure, and, I mean uh, this is Windsor right Hills. Yeah, yeah. This, Ray Charles used to be right up the street. You know, sure, right? and uh, you know Ndugu. Do you know Ndugu? Yeah, Chesley's? oh god, right down the street here. I said yeah. Tony Thompson yeah. was my favorite drummer, yeah. and I meant it. <laughs> Ndugu. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. He, uh, I'm trying to think of what he played on recently that I found out that I didn't realize. Was, oh, Dookie Stick. Uh, I didn't realize was in Dugu. And, yeah, uh, man. A lot of the song, uh, songs from that era. Another guy that's nearby here is uh, James Gadsden. Yeah. He's still at it, too. But, wow. Uh, they're all in this little community. Little here. enclave of, <laughs> of, you know, Windsor Hills was always known as the black beverly hills so if you if you made it in music it makes sense to be here and that the community and it is a this neighborhood just sort of breathes yes it, it's a, an artistic it's a, quality before i guess the musician or the, the artsy community was uh doctors and successful uh people of the black community yeah and but there's a mixture of folks too i mean you know it's there's a lot of different nationalities nowadays everything's all over yeah the place. yeah that's true but this used to be i think primarily a creole settlement and if i you, was going to ask you about the jazz cafe with the creole food yeah the, the louisiana was a lot of louisiana and then right across simply wholesome uh -huh. there's a whole louisiana little thing theme going on but that's not by accident because there was it was like a little the community was here settlement yeah and we we're not from here we just moved here 12 was it 
12 years ago. We happen to be Creole. <laughs> so we fit right in, I guess. That wasn't yeah. on purpose. Yeah, no. That was just yeah. accidental that you would move into the musical Creole neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sometimes sometimes a piece of earth calls to you, I suppose. There you go. That's a good one. I might steal that for a song, by the way. But I won't steal that. You can <laughs> yeah, get it. steal it from you all Yeah. Man. I yeah, know. Yeah. What would you say? A piece? Say that again? We got it on tape. Uh, you're gonna you, listen to the break it down show. Yeah, yeah. I gotta have to hear. <laughs> you gotta grab the magic when it comes out because yeah, I can't was, recall it. Well, that's a uh, senior moment. Yeah, I can, that was five seconds ago. I don't know. <laughs> okay, maybe it wasn't strong enough a hook. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't strong enough a hook. Okay, well, okay. firmly back in my place. This is uh once again, I thank you, Preston. Man, it's been such an enriching experience getting to know you and Gina. Aside from all of the musical stuff that you've given us that we love about you, man, I just enjoy following you and Gina both on Facebook because one of these days I would like to, and of course I say this knowing that I'm trying to do it now, uh, but just enjoy my life the way you enjoy yours, man. Mm, well, Musically, you, man. creatively, you're surrounded by love and grandchildren and, you know, every time you post something on facebook it just seems like everything that you both exude just love and spreading happiness and that we really thank you for appreciate that and thank you so much all right preston glass everybody <laughs>